Hi, welcome to Sabbath School Daily, where we have been studying from this lesson right here, Psalms. This week we're studying from lesson number three, which has the title, The Lord Reigns, and today is Tuesday's lesson, which has the title, God is the Judge. Today's lesson is about a very important subject, God as the Judge of the World. That God is the Judge of the World is made abundantly clear in the whole Bible. But the question that many may ask is, what kind of judge is God? And so today's lesson really covers Psalm chapter 75. It's a very brief psalm. There are only 10 verses, and I'd like to read it to you before we actually begin our study. Look at what it says. Psalm 75. We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks. For your wondrous works declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high, do not speak with a stiff neck, for exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. There is so much that can be said about this psalm, but we're going to focus on a few parts. The lesson points out two basic things today. First of all, that God does indeed judge the wicked and that evil does not go unpunished. But remember what the psalm says in verse 2. It says, when I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The timing of God's judgment is something that we will always have a difficult time with because God does not operate in our time frame. We want God to do things the way we want them done. We want him to operate in the way that we want him to operate. And that's just not how the God of the Bible is. Our God is not a tame God. He's going to do things the way that he decides to do them. And part of being a follower of God, part of being a Christian is learning how to let God be God. But the truth is, is that there will be a judgment of the wicked. Later on in the chapter, in verse 8, we read this. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. This description walks hand in hand with broader biblical narratives of the day of the Lord and the wrath of the Lord. One thing that you need to remember, though, is that there's a big difference between God's wrath and our wrath. This isn't God simply losing his temper or throwing a temper tantrum. God's wrath is understood as effectus. And what that means is that it's an effect of evil. It comes as a consequence of misdeeds and of sin. It's not effectus. And what that means is that it's not passionate. It's not a wrath that has to do with God losing his temper and becoming passionate because he got angry at some human. That's not what the Bible presents. We have a difficulty here because all that we understand is human emotion. So when it comes to God, we want to apply human emotion to him. Be careful with that. You're not just dealing with any other human. You're dealing with the Lord of heaven. And he is different, so very different from us little humans on planet Earth. The first paragraph of today's lesson says the following. As the sovereign king, the Lord is also a lawgiver and a judge. The wicked constantly threaten the just order that God established in the world. But the Lord will judge the world and bring the rule of evil to its end. Remember, he's going to do so in his own time, but he is going to do so. That is a biblical promise. The second paragraph goes on in the same scope of what we're talking about here. It says, in Psalm 75, several images depict the irrevocable destruction of the wicked. The image of a cup with red wine conveys the intensity of God's fury. Cutting off the horns of the wicked depicts the end of their power and dominion while the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. God chooses a proper time or appointed time for his judgment. This executive judgment clearly will take place at the end of time. And if you read Psalm 96 verse 13, that's exactly what you're going to find, a reference to the second coming, to the end of all things. But this is just one part of today's lesson because the second part has to do with God judging the righteous, judging his children. And this is something that for a long time was very confusing, especially before the Protestant reform, when people didn't understand that judgment was a good thing. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, used to say that he hated God and he hated the righteousness that came from scripture because it was something that was demanded of him. Only later did he find out that the righteousness that God speaks about in scripture, it's not demanded, it's offered, it's a gift. And that's precisely what we find about God's judgment when it comes to his children. 
God's judgment, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. He's deeming his children righteous. Look at what the lesson says in the following paragraphs. The Lord probes people's hearts as part of his judgment. Read Psalm 14 verse 2. It is reminiscent of Genesis 6 verse 5 and 8. And basically what Psalm 14 verse 2 says, it speaks about the Lord looking down on earth to see if there are any righteous people. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 and 8 speak about when the Lord came down and saw the evil on planet earth, the evil that was continuously on the hearts of men. And then he speaks about Noah. Noah was righteous. He was found righteous before the Lord. So this is the Lord looking down from heaven, looking for people who are walking in righteousness. Remember that righteousness is something that is given to us by the Lord and we accept it and we live in it. We practice it, but it comes from him. And so none of this has to do primarily with our own efforts, but our acceptance of God's efforts for us and our desire to live in his efforts, to live within his law, to live within his love. But the text continues. Both texts show that the execution of God's judgment of the world is preceded by God's examination of the people's lives and seeking whomever he can save. This judgment is something called the investigative judgment, when God defends the righteous and decides the fate of the wicked. Notice that wording, when God defends the righteous and decides the fate of the wicked. Then the lesson proposes a question, how does it work? Well, first, God delivers his people from the wicked. You can find that in Psalm 97, verse 10, Psalm 146, verse 9, and crowns the humble with salvation. That's found in Psalm 149, verse 4. Second, the unrepentant wicked are destroyed forever. You'll find that in Psalm 97, verse 3. Some Psalms poetically describe the uselessness of human weapons against the divine judge. For example, Psalm 76, verse 3 through 6. The Lord is also a forgiving God. Although he punishes people's misdeeds, Psalm 99, verse 8, God's people, not only the wicked, shall give an account to God. And that's in Psalm 50, verse 4, Psalm 135, verse 14. Finally, the Psalms convey the same notion that is expressed in other biblical texts, that God's judgment begins with God's people and is extended to the whole earth. The psalmist cries to God to judge him, but relies on God's righteousness to defend him. And this reveals a great thing about God, which is that while he is our judge, he is at the same time our defense attorney. He defends us from the accuser, from Satan. I hope that you notice that investigative judgment, it's not something that appears only in the context of the end times. It's not something that only appears in the context of 1844 and the prophecies of Daniel chapter 8 and 9 and Revelation 10. Investigative judgment is something that is as old as the world. God has always fairly investigated his people to make publicly known what he is doing. Our God is not a God of mystery. He is a God of transparency. And everything that we need to know to be saved and to understand the basics of what is going on, he has provided for us. So I hope that you study your lesson today. There are so many texts to look up, to consider when thinking about this topic of investigative judgment, be that for the righteous and for the unrighteous, that I truly hope that you give your time, spend time in the word, learning more about this. Please remember to comment down below. I love hearing from you. And also remember to like, to share, and to subscribe to our videos. We release one every day. And I hope to see you again here tomorrow for another Sabbath School Daily.